Hello and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Carrie Williams, Associate Director of Alumni Events at York University. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this webinar is part of our Scholars Hub speaker series, which features educational lectures by academics from York. We are so pleased to be able to bring this series online to allow even more of our alumni and friends to hear from some of York's leading scholars. Uh, as this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that the following land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. Uh, we ask that if this is the case, you take responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, sorry, First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably care and share for the Great Lakes region. Uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land. I'd like to highlight that although this is the last Scholars Hub of the calendar year of 2020, what a year, uh, we will be back after the holidays with even more relevant and timely content for you. Uh, our first session of 2021 will be on January 21st with a special Thursday edition about the U.S. presidential inauguration. For more information about the Scholars Hub at Home series, as well as our other virtual events, please visit our website at yorku.ca slash alumni and friends or email us at alumni at yorku.ca. And as those of you who have joined us from previous events will know, uh, we always like to get to know who's in our audience. It helps us, it helps our speaker. Um, so today's question is, uh, how often have you attended Scholars Hub since the beginning of September? Uh, the poll should, it's already popped up on your screen uh, and I'll give everybody a moment to respond. In the virtual space, the more we can connect with you, the better. <laughs> to get to know people. And I'll just give the, or just wait for the results there. Okay. Oh, kind of an, an even split. Um, my first time, we have about 27% 27, 27 with, this is your first time. So welcome uh, to, to our series. 28% uh, of you once or twice, 35% of you five times or less. And then, uh, oh, all this, a few people who've come to all the sessions and 10 sessions. So listen, we are so grateful um, for this opportunity to connect with you. And those of you who've been coming back week after week, uh, we've learned a lot from you and we take our cues from you about what you wanna hear. So thank you so much for digging that poll, for coming week after week. And for those of you who are newer, um, welcome. Welcome to the, welcome to the, to the community. If you ever need help with uh, the Zoom webinar, uh, please feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. A uh, whole team is there to help you. Uh, that same button can be used to submit your questions for our speaker today uh, during, as we will have a Q&A section at the bottom um, after her presentation. And for those of you who are watching on Facebook, feel free to submit any questions or comments in the comment section of the video and the team will send them my way. I could not be more excited about today's topic. It's titled Memory and Decision Making in the Time of COVID-19, featuring Shana Rosenbaum, Professor, Department of Psychology, Faculty of Health. Shana is a professor um, and York Research Chair in Cognitive, Cognitive Neuroscience of Memory in the Department of Psychology and Vision, Science to Applications Program at York, Associate Scientist at the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest, and registered as a clinical neuro 
a psychologist with the College of Psychologists of Ontario. She received her PhD in psychology and neuroscience from the University of Toronto in 2003 and completed a postdoctorate fellowship at Rotman. She, is published extensive, she has published extensively on the topic of memory in the aging brain and in neurological disorders and has received numerous awards for her neuroimaging and patient research. Her research is funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. She is an elected member of the Royal Society of Canada College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists, and is a past member of the Board of Trustees of the Ontario Science Centre. Welcome, Dr. Rosenbaum. I haven't seen you pop up quite yet. There you are. Thank you very much, Carrie. It's wonderful to be here. Okay, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today I'm going to be speaking to you about some work that we've been doing that is very relevant to understanding the effects of COVID-19, especially on the way we remember things and the way that we make decisions. And um, I would like to first acknowledge um, York University and in particular the Vision Science to Applications program known as VISTA uh, for their ongoing support of the work that we've been doing in my lab. So before I begin, I wanted to kind of set the stage and tell you a little bit about the kind of work that we do in my lab, um, just so that you understand why there are certain types of memory that we've been interested in investigating and also in decision making. So we've been interested in a very small part of the brain. It's actually a very old part of the brain um, from an evolutionary perspective known as the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, this tiny little structure, hopefully you can see my arrow, um, and it's, it's magnified here. It's a region that's been strongly associated with our ability to form new memories and maintain new memories, and also to retrieve those memories even after a long time has passed. And you can see uh, the structure here in a three-dimensional view. Unfortunately, this part of the brain is highly vulnerable to the effects of aging and age-related disease. And what I depict here is actually a graph. It's really hypothetical, but it shows that the volume of the hippocampus, so the size of it, actually shrinks with age beginning as early as age 35. And actually this um, volume loss in the hippocampus does translate to changes in how it functions. So the hippocampus is known, as I mentioned, for memory. And it actually seems to support specific kinds of memory and probably the kinds of memory that really make us human and that allow us to go about our day-to-day -day lives. And here, as you see, um, you see some a depiction of various events that, we, that might've taken place across our lives. We refer to this form of memory as episodic memory. So memory for the specific details of past personal events that are very specific to a time and place. Individuals who have damage to the hippocampus, and even older individuals as we age, we tend to lose the details of these forms of memory. We still might remember some of these events, but we might not remember them in as crisp detail as we would if we were younger. Individuals with Alzheimer's disease, so that's actually more of an extreme, um, that neurodegenerative disease actually targets the hippocampus very early on. And so if you're familiar with people with Alzheimer's disease, you might know that they tend to lose uh, personal memories quite early on in the disease. Um, but it turns out that the hippocampus is also needed for our ability to navigate in space. And so people who have disruption to the hippocampus actually have difficulties learning how to navigate in new places. And in my lab, and you'll, you'll see some pictures of my students soon, um, we investigate these questions in patients who have damage to the hippocampus as a result of a variety of neurological conditions, including Alzheimer's disease. And we do so using uh, non-invasive imaging techniques like magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. And here you see a picture of our own MRI at York University in the Sherman building. And we can look at the structure 
in quite precise detail using MRI and also the function of brain regions based on uh, blood flow and we can measure um, oxygenated to deoxygenated blood flow and have a sense of parts of the brain that are activated while someone's actually performing a memory task in the scanner. In my lab, we also rely on virtual reality. We try to really recreate naturalistic conditions so that we can really understand better what is impaired and what is spared in our participants. And another method that we use is eye tracking. So it turns out that eye movements provide a bit of a window into the functioning of the hippocampus. And we do tend to use um, methods like this in order to understand how this brain region functions, what it does, how different forms of memory break down if it's disrupted. The reason I mention these types of technologies in particular is because you can imagine that with COVID and provincial restrictions, um, it's been very difficult to conduct the kind of research that we've been doing all along. So many of my students are unable to visit the Sherman Center and go through the hallways and test participants in close quarters because it's simply not allowed. And so it's really important um, to note that, so this is, this is actually, um, these are the students, many of the students in my lab currently and postdoctoral fellows who have run um, many different experiments. You'll hear some of the findings that we've collected uh, recently um, that actually are relevant to COVID. And as an educator, as a professor, I, it's my responsibility to make sure that our students are accommodated, that they're able to conduct the research that's necessary for their degrees. And it's also important that we flexibly adapt our research questions and approaches to answering them to ensure continuation of high, a high quality education. But of course, another responsibility that we have is to share our knowledge that may be relevant to um, the COVID pandemic. And we have to do so while of course being careful not to extend our reach. Um, we don't want to try and fit every kind of research question that we have into um, COVID because simply that's not, it's not necessarily relevant. And in fact, it might actually change the course of what we're trying to do and the effectiveness of it. But one question in my lab that is highly relevant is this one. It relates to how, our, how COVID actually changes the way that we make decisions and whether we could change those kinds of decisions if we provide some kinds of aids um, based on some of the work that we've done in memory. And the focus that I'll, I'll, I'll place focus um, specifically on delay and probabilistic discounting. And you'll hear a little bit about that. Actually, I'm gonna show a demonstration of what this is. Um, and it involves making decisions uh, between rewards, uh, either at between rewards that are received immediately versus in the distant future or that are certain versus uncertain. We also do this with losses, but I'm not going to focus on that today. So in the pandemic, we've had to make many sorts of decisions, um, many of which relate to taking protective measures in order to counteract or at least prevent ourselves and other people from becoming ill. And one of these um, protective measures, of course, is social distancing. And so this is what you see here. And you could think of this actually as maybe even an immediate gain, but a very small gain or a small reward that you're able to still be with people, but you know it's not exactly under the conditions that you would like. But if you actually follow those guidelines, then perhaps in a few months, um, I'm hoping, uh, we'll have the opportunity to have get togethers where we don't need to socially distance, where we can be indoors and we can enjoy each other's company. An example of an immediate loss could be having to wear a face mask. It's not very comfortable. It actually reduces our ability to recognize people that we know to communicate easily and effectively. But taking this very small immediate loss relative to having to deal with a much larger, perhaps delayed loss is worth it. So um, here I depict somebody who um, actually has COVID and is being sent to hospital. And so, you know, you can imagine that we're always making these kinds of decisions, especially during COVID, de dealing with uh, accepting an immediate 
smaller reward versus a larger later reward. And so I'm just going to ask my colleagues uh, to present a poll to you, and I'm hoping that you'll participate. This is audience engagement. And I'd like you to, we're going to switch now to monetary rewards. And I'd like you to decide which of these two rewards you would prefer to receive, $50 now or $100 in a month from now. So please make your selection, and then we'll show you the results. Okay, so many people are willing to wait for the $100. All right, so uh, the next question. So another poll. So now which would you prefer to receive? Would, would you prefer to receive $75 today or $100 in a month from now? And so we'll just take a few moments until people respond. Okay, so now you can see that still most people, 77% are more willing to take $100 in a month from now, but there's actually more than the last uh, vote that shows that there are more people that uh, would have taken the $75 today. Okay, and the next question. Okay, would you prefer to receive $90 right now or wait a month and receive $100? We're just getting our responses in. Okay, it's nearly 50-50. So now as the immediate amount increases, people are more willing to take the immediate over the delayed reward. Okay, and one final question. Would you be willing to take $50 today or wait three years for $100? And uh, please make your selections. And we'll see. Okay, we're just about ready, I think. Wow, so you can see that it flips now. And so before we were changing the amount of the immediate reward, this time we changed the number, the amount of time that you had to wait for the future reward. And so people are less willing to wait three years for $100. And so um, thank you very much for, for putting up the poll. And I'm hoping that I can, okay. So I gave you these hypothetical scenarios, um, kind of social situations, but in the lab, it's much easier to deal with hypothetical amounts, either rewards or losses. And so the first question I had posed to you was $50 now or $100 a month from now, here I'm just showing you a year from now. And people typically will be more willing to choose the immediate reward if it's larger than, um, if it's larger or if there is more time between receiving the immediate reward and the delayed reward. And so this is very typical human behavior. You actually even see this in non-human species, not with money, of course. Um, so it's a very robust phenomenon. Now, I want to just turn very quickly um, to why we were very interested in studying this in the first place in my lab. So this was before COVID. And I'm showing you a picture of someone, his name is Kent Cochran. He goes by the initials KC in the literature. And he is a very famous amnesic person who has been documented extensively. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Um, but here, what you see is um, KC or Kent is describing family photos to his mother. And K Kent unfortunately underwent uh, or, or experienced significant damage to his hippocampus in both hemispheres of his brain as a result of a severe closed head injury from a motorcycle accident. So he's a very extreme case. And here he is able to actually tell his mother about people who were present in photographs from long ago. He can even sit, tell his mother where the events took place. But what he can't do 
is provide any details relating to those events. He actually can't re-experience any of the, those events in memory. It turns out that not only does he have trouble remembering the past, but he also has a lot of trouble imagining future events. And it turns out that many people with hippocampal damage, even individuals with Alzheimer's disease, have trouble imagining a detailed future in which they might participate. There is kind of a stigma now associated with hippocampal damage and amnesia, where people really view these individuals as living in a permanent present. And this is a very famous um, amnesic case, HM, who, uh, so a book, a biography was written by Suzanne Corkin, and she really showcases how HM lived in this permanent present. He was quite content actually, but he couldn't really mentally travel from the past to the future. And we were wondering if people have difficulties remembering the past and imagining the future, would they have difficulties making future regarding decisions such as the one that you made during the poll? Could they decide between accepting an, an immediate reward versus a delayed, uh, a delayed larger reward? And so just to show you here, these are a number of individuals, Casey was included, and I'm just depicting the number of details of future episodes that they were able to generate when we asked them to imagine different events. And compared to control participants indicated by the dark, um, the dark bar, uh, the patients, each patient had a lot of difficulty. They were significantly impaired relative to the controls in generating details of future events. We then asked the participants, so patients and uh, healthy controls who were matched in age and education and other demographics to make these kinds of decisions that you had made. We asked them to decide between a smaller immediate reward versus a larger delayed reward. And we adjusted the amount of the immediate reward as well as the delay uh, until they would receive the, the later reward. And so that's what I just say here. And as I mentioned before, just remember there's a normal tendency to, to discount the value of the larger future reward as the delay to its receipt increases. And we found that the amnesic patients who are indicated by the uh, filled triangles performed very similarly to controls despite the fact that they were unable to imagine any future instances in which they would uh, use the reward. And so they um, showed greater willingness to accept the immediate reward or sorry, the future reward with um, shorter delays, but as the amount of the immediate reward increased or the delay increased, they were less likely to choose that uh, um, future reward. So they were less likely to wait. And this held true if the future reward was $100 or $2,000, it didn't seem to matter. So this is very close to how controls perform. It turns out that people can actually adjust their decision-making if you give them cues to think about specific future instances. And so we took this a step further in the amnesic patients and we asked them to imagine a specific event that we knew actually might take place in the future for them. And while imagining that event to make decisions between accepting an immediate versus a future reward. So it was the same kind of paradigm. The only difference was that they imagined a specific event that might take place in their lifetime. And we actually found that control participants, so these are healthy older adults, they showed a typical um, discounting effect where they discounted future rewards normally across time. But when we gave them the specific cues to imagine events that might take place in the future, they were more mindful of the future and they then accepted the future reward more willingly. And so their discounting became shallower, as you can see by the, um, by the, the solid line here um, compared to the dotted line, which was the, the discounting that they performed without the cues. Amnesic patients, unfortunately, probably not surprisingly, they, they have a lot of difficulty imagining future events and even if we gave them some details to help them imagine, they still did not show any modulation in their discounting performance. There's no significant difference 
between their performance when they were given the standard condition with no cues as indicated by the dotted lines. And remember they're indicate the amnesic patients are indicated by the filled triangles and when they were given cues. So that's indicated by the solid line. So they showed no advantage when they were given the cues. We, so uh, that, that work was actually conducted by a former graduate student. Her name is Donna Kwan. Um, some other work that was conducted by another graduate student of mine, who's currently in the lab, Jenkin Mock, um, he decided to look at whether older adults compared to young adults show a benefit to cueing. And in fact, I'm already giving you the answer, they do. Um, so whether the person is young or old, so the um, young adults are indicated by, it's hard to see, but the filled triangles on the left side, these are just different dollar amounts for uh, the future reward. So young adults do show greater um, modulation of their performance. They do show a tendency to discount the future less when they're given cues, but older adults still do show this modulation. They do benefit from cueing. There is a significant difference between their, um, their discounting with and without cues. So this is very reassuring. Turns out that a different patient population who actually has a lot of difficulty with decision making. So these are individuals with lesions to a particular part of prefrontal cortex. Uh, the VMPFC actually stands for ventromedial prefrontal cortex. This is an image of the brain and it's actually if you were to slice the brain in this plane and you can see the front of the brain here and this is a group of patients. There are 13 patients and the lighter spots indicate the area of greatest overlap in lesion across all these patients with ventromedial prefrontal cortex damage. So these individuals actually discount the future um, in a much steeper way. They're less likely to um, accept a future reward. They're more likely to take the immediate reward. They're, we could say that they're actually impulsive in their decision-making. And when we give them cues, they actually, so they're indicated by the blue line, they, uh, sorry, by the solid lines, um, the black line indicates their performance without cues and the blue line with cues, they perform incredibly well. They actually improve and they are more mindful of the future again. And so this was work that I had conducted along with my very close collaborator at the University of Bologna, um, Elisa Charmelli. So where does this all take us? So it turns out, as I mentioned, that other than people with hippocampal damage and very severe forms of amnesia, most people discount uh, the future normally in a certain way where they're less willing to take a future amount if the immediate amount is larger and if there is a greater delay until you receive the future amount. And it also turns out that most people actually benefit from cues. So if you were if you were to tell someone to really think deeply about something that might happen in the future, they make better decisions. How does this um, play into understanding COVID? So we actually were very fortunate, um, the Canadian government, and some of you might have heard of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, they had a rapid call um, to respond to some of the effects of COVID. So a call for grant applications to deal with certain aspects of COVID from pharmaceutical interventions to other forms of treatment to understanding how we remember and make decisions. And so they funded a project um, that we're conducting now together with a company called Axonify, which actually provides soft, uh, a learning software platform for frontline workers to engage at work and learn about work specific um, information, product information, for example, but also health and safety rules. And they actually have a database of over 2.8 million frontline workers. We connected with them and with the Public Health Agency of Canada. And just, I guess, serendipitously, my collaborators, I mentioned to Lisa Charmelli in Italy, in Northern Italy, in fact, which was hit very early on in the pandemic, and some collaborators who are in New Zealand and in Australia. Um, they've actually had a very, a much easier time in dealing with the pandemic. Our Canadian collaborators and also some American collaborators, and we're able to look at 
the responses of frontline workers and see how decision making might change um, across the pandemic with the different waves. And also, if we are to give individuals cues to think about the future in greater detail, whether they would change the kinds of decisions they would make. We're connecting this to mental health variables such as levels of anxiety and also depression. And finally, we're looking at the relationship between decision making and our tolerance of certainty or uncertainty, I should say. Clearly, we still have an uncertain future. We don't really know when things will change and return to normal. And some people are much more sensitive to this uncertainty than others and might make different kinds of decisions based on that uncertainty. And here I'm just showing some preliminary data. This is actually young adults, um, not frontline workers. And we actually replicate the effects of discounting not just rewards, but also losses, which are discounted uh, less deeply. Um, it's a whole other story. And we're seeing if providing um, cues to think more about the future might change their behaviors. So I just wanted to thank um, especially the students and postdoctoral fellows who were directly involved in this work. Julia Halilova in particular has been leading the work that we're doing um, in relation to the COVID-19. Uh, COVID um, I'd also like to uh, give special thanks to Jonna Rose Addis, Elisa Charamelli, Carl Craver, Len Green and Joel Meyerson, my collaborators uh, here in Toronto, also in Italy and in the US. And I'd just like to thank you all very much for your, uh, for attending and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Shana, that was, that was so informative. Um, and just want to acknowledge we are so for we are so fortunate to have um, you um, and your team of researchers at a time when you're not able to do the work you typically would be doing in your lab still doing work that supports all of us in terms of understanding the impact or the the, the relevance of your work in this context of covid so thank you so much thank you so much for doing that thank you uh, for to you that. yeah it's really our pleasure and as I said, a responsibility, I think, um, yeah. to try and inform people and uh, take what we have and, and pivot in right. a meaningful way. Right, right, right. Thank you. Um, we have over 100 people here with us today um, and I guarantee you we have lots of questions because we haven't looked at COVID from this angle, uh, how it's affecting our ability to make decisions. It's affecting our ability to think long-term and, and we haven't quite looked at it in that way. Um, so I will share with the audience, um, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, if you're on Zoom, if you're watching by Facebook, you can submit your questions to the video and, and we'll get those questions as well. Um, so I'm just gonna start with, um, uh, with this question. Uh, which is why, why might people be experiencing COVID fatigue? It's a very good question. And it's, it's a, there's a, it, I think there are many different answers. Um, you know, one, one issue of course, is that we're, uh, we're used to novelty. We're used to a change in routine. And right now yeah. we're, we're really living the mundane in a way. Um, you know, it's really hard to separate one moment from the next. There's nothing really that stands out in our day. Um, and we also really, really want to be able to return to normal. Um, and I think it's a very natural, uh, it's a, it's a natural, wanting. Um, you know, we're, we're social beings. We want to be able to be with family members, visit people in long-term care. Um, if we unfortunately have uh, loved ones there, uh, be together, do activities that we are used to doing and that we no longer can do, take vacations and so on. And, and simply this isn't possible. So I guess I'm giving kind of a common sense answer. Um, but I do believe that uh, the research will back, back this up. And uh, I think the, the big challenge is how do we break out of this COVID fatigue, especially after nine months of dealing with the same thing over and over again. Yeah, yeah, and like sort of your, your research suggests, it, we don't have a clear long-term benefit. <laughs> like, I mean, we know that at some point there'll be a vaccine, you know, but it, it's not, it still doesn't feel real. It still doesn't feel tangible. So as we're making decisions to this supposed point where, where there'll be a vaccine and we'll all be able to get it, it's still, we're still stressed, we're still stressed in this space. Yeah, absolutely. 
I think it's interesting also just very quickly. I mean, today they just announced that um, I think, I believe the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine was approved in Canada. I, I hope I'm not uh, misstating uh, that. Um, and so, you know, if we were to test people in the moment today, their responses to the kinds of decisions I described before might be very different than yesterday. Than yesterday, uh, so yeah. There is hope, and I don't, I don't think we have a bleak future. I think we have a very positive future. Things are moving in the right direction, but I really do think we need to, um, you know, take charge and make sure that we stay safe and just keep going. It's yeah. very important. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, would you say are there other implications of your research for understanding and dealing with, with COVID-19? Um, we actually have some other research that's being done um, that relates to how to deal with COVID-19. I mean, one piece actually that's being uh, led by my collaborator, Donna Addis, relates to how are we gonna remember this time? So is it gonna just seem like a blur? I mean, again, there's really no, there's nothing that's, um, defining, or I shouldn't say nothing, but, you know, most of our days seem very similar, especially if you're working from home and, you know, you're not really taking breaks and going outside. And, you know, we, we would predict that people are going to think in a more general way of the time during COVID, even if there are some significant events that have occurred. And so, you know, one important thing, and I think this also helps uh, deal with mental health issues, is to make sure that you take time to change your routine. I mean, if you're, if it means um, picnicking indoors <laughs> or with your family or, you know, taking a walk, um, just really breaking up the day, not having, you know, work flow into the nighttime, it's, it's critical. And I think it will help us remember moments in a different way too. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question from our audience, Sarah, um, she asked, Given the emphasis on mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques, especially in the past six months, how do you think that plays into um, memory and decision-making? It's a tricky question because I've just been promoting something very different. I'm saying, think about the future. Um, you know, in or I, I would say there's great benefits to mindfulness. And I think in the moment, um, it's really important to be able to uh, reduce anxiety, especially if you have anxiety relating to the pandemic and it really is widespread. Um, and you know, it, it may help actually in some ways with memory in other ways it might um, affect the way we make decisions differently. Uh, there's really no, I, I think, clear answer with respect to how it might um, change the way we make decisions. Um, I don't think it would change our adherence to protective measures, it might actually make us more mindful of ourselves and hopefully of other people. Um, but you know, without without numbers, without actual data, I can't really speak to that. Um, you know, but we do know that there are tremendous benefits to mental health. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I would highly encourage mindfulness practices if you, especially if you're doing so already. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I was so interested in, in, in what you had to say today is, is how um, your, how memory and decision making shows up in older adults. And it's obviously it's, it's extreme as Alzheimer's, but you sort of start to inch towards that um, as you age. Um, and we know in this context, COVID has had such a major impact on older adults. Um, is there any positive <laughs> Is there any positive side to that story? Yeah, you know, it's actually interesting, especially in healthy older adults. There, uh, there was a study that just came out in Psychological Science in a journal um, that shows that uh, there's something known as the positivity bias in older adults, that as we get older, one positive aspect is actually that we tend to remember positive events, positive information better than negative information and even neutral information. Um, there's some debate about it, but it looks like that continues even in COVID. Um, there were many, uh, there was a large sample that was tested of older adults and it looks like they're retaining this positivity bias despite everything that's going on. Um, mm. You know, that might not apply to individuals who are in long-term care for instance, but um, I think, you know, the average person who is an older adult seems to be showing um, some positivity uh, bias based on these data. Right. So I would say that that's a positive. 
For sure. And and does that actually, um, remembering the positive events, does that actually turn around the illness or turn, you know, sort of reverse some of the aging effects or no? Is it just um, it's That's also a tricky question to answer. Uh, there, It just seems as though older adults tend to show this bias, whether it's there, there is some suggestion that if you can make people think in a more positive way and um, you know reduce stress, it does have positive effects on um, our brain function. Uh, as does, by the way, you know we said mindfulness exercise, physical activity actually does have proven effects on our brains functioning, even the, especially the hippocampus actually, um, which is the seat ever thought of as a seat of memory. Um, so, so yes, I think that, you know, there is some complex interaction, uh, but there are health benefits. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question from, uh, Richard from the audience. He asks, what are the implications of this research for government policy? For example, encouraging mask wearing or more topically encourage people to get vaccines once they're actually available. Yeah, I mean, I think it's in line with the messaging that the government has already um, taken, especially the Canadian government. And, you know, it may actually direct, uh, so this is with respect to kind of advertising and, um, uh, but in terms of policy, uh, I think it really also rubber stamps, um, you know, this need to encourage and, and maybe even legislate mask wearing during these um, these difficult times, especially when the numbers are so high, social yeah. distancing and so on. I think that we're unfortunately getting some mixed messaging. Um, you know, I think the government is doing its best to balance the needs of the economy with the needs of, you know, its citizens and, and our health. Uh, but, you know, I think we really have to take seriously the call to, you know, not bubble with other people right now to, um, socially distanced to, you know, to really just be with your family members indoors at this time. Um, when you're outdoors, you know, it might be a bit of a different story, but wear masks, especially in public places. Um, and, you know, if they, if they could state in a more uh, strict way in policy, um, some of these uh, regulations that would be, I think, highly effective. Uh, but, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're working with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, we do feed our data to them and we actually try to model it together with data relating to how the, pan the course of the pandemic. Um, and we're really hopeful that they'll integrate some of what we have to say into policy as, as we collect more data. Great thing. And you know, what you're saying really can't be said enough, right? It, it just can't um, in terms of what we need to be doing. Uh, this is a, a great question. I think everybody in the audience will benefit from. So thank you for this. Um, and the question is, how might we remember the pandemic years from now? Yeah, so I mean, this is sort of what I was touching on before. Great question. And I have to say all the questions so far have been wonderful. So thank you so much for, for providing them. Um, you know, it, again, it's really tough to say, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, because there really aren't clear boundaries, and we know that memory Memories are really formed um, based on boundaries, event boundaries within our day. Uh, so things that really define one event from another, we don't have those same kinds of boundaries. And so we might really remember the pandemic in a more generic way. Um, it's, but again, like I said, it, it'll depend on, you know, who's doing the remembering. I mean, whether, you know, based on age, based on, your situation. I mean, if I'm a frontline worker, I might remember it very differently. Uh, I might remember some significant, you know, events relative to some other people who don't experience those same events. Um, but my guess is that without really breaking the routine, we're likely to see it as sort of, or remember it as a sea of, <laughs> of sameness to some extent, other than, you know, the, uh, the novel, uh, call or novel um, news event item went with respect to, uh, you know, the vaccine being developed and so on. And mm -hmm. so okay. it'll, it'll be interesting. I think there'll be a lot of work on this topic. For sure. I don't know if this falls into the section of research you did that you didn't, you didn't cover today around losses. Um, but the question from the audience, her name is Anne, is Please explain the choice people make to not observe COVID rules. 
What's yeah, so it's 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 a tough one to answer. Also, we're we're not uh, we're looking at losses with regard to like very similar to what I described, where we set it up uh, set up experiments where people have to decide between an immediate reward and a larger later reward. We do the same with losses. People are very averse to to loss. Um, they seem to be uh, risk averse in a way and also averse to losing. And so they're more likely actually to um, wait. Uh, they, might, they might be more likely, for example, to wait into the future um, to avoid loss. Uh, you know, it, I wish I could tell, give you an answer right now. We're, we're hoping that we will have an answer soon. Um, but in terms of, you know, deciding not to socially distance or, or not to wear a mask. I mean, I think, again, it's complicated. Some people really don't want to lose their rights and freedoms. Um, you know, actually, it's interesting to compare Canada to the US in this regard, um, yeah. where there's an even more extreme view in that way. Um, and again, we're really hoping we'll have some answers. And uh, I'm happy to direct you to my website. Once we do have answers, we will, uh, we will uh, advertise and repost them. Um, but, you know, I think some individuals are just really, you know, it's based on personality, it's based on the ability to empathize with other people. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that people really can put themselves in other people's shoes and think about what the consequences are of not wearing masks, not socially distancing. Um, yeah. The loss to others, <laughs> right? Thinking about that, yeah. And that's it, that's it. Yeah. It's a, pers a small personal gain, but a great yeah. loss for other people. Yeah, yeah. Um, is your web, can you share your URL now? Because we can note that and share it with the audience if, you, if you'd like. Yes, and just so that uh, I'll do so on the chat. Perfect, um, yeah. And just to let you know that it will, it's, it's being updated, so. That's fine, that's fine. Yeah, only if you're comfortable, like you can share it with us later if you'd like it. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. And, uh, and so we, we don't have uh, the information up yet on our COVID uh, studies, but we hope to have yeah. share that soon. Wonderful. I have a very personal question um, from somebody in the audience um, who shares, um, uh, I'm losing, I am losing memory. And is there a way that I can participate in your research? So I'm, I'm sorry that you're experiencing memory loss. Um, I'm very happy to, you're welcome to send me an email. I'll actually include my email address as oh, well. I, I do take emails. I do um, enjoy engaging with the public. And we are conducting some work um, that involves individuals who are experiencing significant memory loss. Um, and yes, uh, you know, even if you're not experiencing memory loss, but you're interested in being engaged in research, we. Uh, we really encourage people to participate in the work that we're doing. Um, and I hope, you know, that we're able to, to help you out as well. Thank you. Again, the gift of, of our community, our professors here, not only are you sort of skilled researcher, you're also very generous and kind. So thank you for sharing that, that that's great. Um, another question for you. Um, what, in your opinion, measures can we take to promote healthy cognitive aging? Very interested in this. Yeah, I mean, very similar measures to what we would encourage even before uh, the pandemic. So as I mentioned, physical exercise, uh, so aerobic actually exercise has been shown to change the function of the hippocampus and actually other parts of the brain. Um, so keeping the body healthy, I mean, the brain is part of the body. And so that's key. A healthy diet, of course, is very important reducing stress. So mindfulness is an excellent way of doing so. Um, but if you have other ways of reducing stress, by all means, um, you should practice them. And really just staying cognitively active. Um, you know, people do say that crossword puzzles help. Um, there's some debate about whether uh, some of the online kinds of uh, cognitive training programs work. Um, it certainly wouldn't hurt. Uh, so really, and I would also say being social. Now that's a tricky one during COVID, right? Right, but, right. You know, my guess, and, and I'm sure again, there, there would be studies on this that are going to come out, um, even social engagement over Zoom and yeah. being part of groups, even if it's like a book club online um, or driveway visits, these things are so important uh, to our cognitive health. And uh, I would strongly, strongly emphasize 
uh, taking these kinds of measures to to promote um, brain and cognitive health. Yeah, yeah, and you know it, it's it's one of those try to balance the you know, people talk about Zoom fatigue. I don't want to be in another Zoom meeting. Try to balance that between how you are doing emotionally and and the need to connect with people. It's it's so unreal how much we've underestimated the value of just connecting with people, um, and how that affects us. Um, thank you so much. I also plug that we also, for, with uh, in our alumni engagement team, we do have a book club as well. So we've had um, we've done two books so far and have a great following. So if you're interested, uh, audience, please feel free to to check that out. It's on our website as well. Um, Shana, thank you so much. This has been incredible um, and so such great information. So generous with your information and again your whole team. Uh, for taking on this work where you're limited in what you can do, but taking on the work to kind of help us all through this. So thank you so much for your time today and for everything that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thanks to the audience for being so engaged and uh, really excellent questions. Yeah, thank yeah, they're great. We're very fortunate with our audience. They're, they're, they're great. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up. But before we do, we always like to take the time to get one last question into the audience. Um, of course, we are very um, knee deep into planning for 2021, always need and want your feedback. Uh, the question is, what would you like to see as part of the Scholars Hub at Home experience in 2021? And there's sort of three choices there. Uh, please feel free to tell us what you think. Um, as we approach the end of our final session, if you can believe it, our final session of 2021, uh, sorry, of 2020, before we get to 2021, what a year we've had. Um, I'd personally like to thank um, the community for the privilege to connect with you week after week in this new format. Uh, speaking of memories, this series will be definitely one of mine and one of my teams, our whole team's sort of key memory from, from the pandemic year is creating this series and figuring out how to connect with you. Uh, we do consider ourselves so fortunate to have been able to try something new um, and share knowledge and stay connected with you throughout a very uncertain and confusing time. Uh, as professionals, not only have we gained skills, but we've just grown as people. Um, and we have you and our audience and our professors like Shana and her team to thank for that. We genuinely appreciate your feedback and need your feedback, your interest in the work uh, and your questions. And we hope that it has been as positive and impactful for you as it has been on us. Uh, so thank you as we close the year. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to stay connected with you every week. Since April, we've had over 25 of these Scholars Hub at Home webinars with almost 100 attendees each time. Uh, we've analyzed COVID-19 from so many perspectives. Um, and then we also did the reflection and action work against anti-Black racism. We've covered a broad range of thought-provoking research and showcasing some of York's best minds like Shana today, um, thanks to what you've told us you want to hear. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge our partners, Aurora Public Library and Markham Public Library through their collaboration and support we've been able to make an even greater impact and create and reach a larger audience. Uh, please feel free to share today's talk and all of our Scholars Hub at Home events of 2020 uh, with your friends. It will be posted on our York Alumni YouTube channel. Uh, you may also join our LinkedIn group or follow us on Facebook by searching York University Alumni and follow us on Instagram. Uh, and Twitter, at York U Alumni. Uh, suggestions and feedbacks, as you well know, um, are always needed and welcome. We listen to everything. Uh, they can be sent to us through any of those social channels or directly at alumni at yorku.ca. So just a reminder, this is our last session of 2020. Uh, we will be back in 2021 on Thursday, January 21st with a special Scholars Hub edition about the US presidential election. Uh, we figured uh, those of you who are interested in the inauguration will be watching the proceedings on Wednesday at our typical time. So we're holding our Scholars Hub on Thursday. Then we'll be back again on Wednesday, January 27th with Dr. Raphael and the importance of the social determinant of health. Uh, to learn more about these events or even our book club as uh, or previously mentioned, please visit our website yorku.ca slash alumni and friends and click on events. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday season and we will see you in the new year.